I like my We're waiting hand. for, uh, ah, yeah. we're coming online here, okay. There are actually people who, you know, put the little faces on the back of my head, comes back there. Good evening. Tonight is the July 18th, 2017 meeting of the City of Rolling Meadows Committee, the whole meeting. Um, we have five items on the agenda tonight. Mr. Crumstock, you want to lead off the band? Sure thing. Uh, the first item for folks at the home deals with a redevelopment uh, project that's going to be happening at the Holiday Inn, Holiday Inn Express property. That's roughly 7.14 acres. Um, it's obviously something that Alderman Diastas, uh, former Mayor Tom Rooney, myself have been having meetings since um, January of 2016 that we've been discussing with this group. So obviously in the packet and also for residents at home is going to be a brief PowerPoint. This is the same one that we went through um, with the Economic Development Committee meeting that recently was had. The other thing in front of all the council members is actually now a timeline given by the group that actually talks about um, what we're actually looking for, and I'll refer to that in a little bit. Hopefully the batteries are still doing better than the last time that I did this, but, um, and again, it is a quick PowerPoint. Um, obviously the current status, the Holiday Inn um, has been redone about 10 years ago. Um, <laughs> Obviously now it's getting a little aged and um, there are a lot of vacancies that are happening throughout the Holiday Inn. The Holiday Inn Express is really pretty much dominated by a lot of um, repeat folks who come here and again they're holding their own but it, the interior design is actually um, going to the next stage that we talk about. So the renewal for the franchise of the license, um, obviously when they originally did it, it was only a 10-year lease. Um, that is coming up for the Holiday Inn on January 2018. And obviously the Holiday Inn Express, with their um, lease and renewal as it comes up, there's some work that needs to be done. So part of the market conditions, I have actually said how the hotel rooms are growing and being used throughout the area but also both hotels are lagging within the Schomburg area. So there are two challenges that actually have existed for the partners who are sitting behind me and actually would answer any additional questions. But really the buildings that are in distress, there needs to be a lot of TLC in all the buildings, but also many of the hotels in the market are actually putting pressure on newer, flashier, better places too. And the, obviously the quality of the brand that this group has actually looked at, and you'll hear about that, going from a Holiday Inn to what you'll hear in just a little bit about the Aloft, which is a Marriott Sherwood um, product. So that management, as I said before, it's the same group that has been around since 2006 when they did this before. They're actually been aggressively working on this process um, and then looking at it. Obviously, there were two options uh, with the redevelopment and where we actually sat at this point in time. And as I said before, there have been a lot of discussions and a lot of PowerPoints that we've sat through. This PowerPoint that you have is one of their PowerPoints just shortened a little bit for that. So the redevelopment solution that they actually came up with is really taking the nine-story building and making that into an A-loft hotel. The two-story building would be an assisted living location, and then the Holiday Inn Express would actually go into what's this new formula blue design concept. So a little bit of everything that goes on here. So the Aloft by uh, Marriott Starwood, it actually is flashier. It actually has a lot more work that needs to be done. The assisted uh, memory care facility actually has a nice little look. And then the Holiday Inn Express with the formula blue design actually brings up um, a lot more in the building that Sam Patel and his group have actually started to work with Holiday Inn Express. So the Aloft Hotel franchise, um, it's going to be obviously 20 year lease. Um, there is some work on it. When they talk about a secure to five mile area, it's actually 2.5 radius around that. So it does protect um, where another Aloft would actually be in the community or around the surrounding areas. Um, it does help them for marketing and actually making sure what's around. The other thing is 
the latest for the Formula Blue is actually one of the newer Holiday Inn Express uh, markets that they're actually working on. So it has another 10-year lease for the Holiday Inn Express, but it also brings up a lot more into this. And again, it's typically people who are looking for, you know, more of those suites and uh, staying a little bit longer with anything else that goes on. The other part is the assisted living memory care facility. Tapestry would be the, um, own, not the owner, but the operator of this assisted living memory care facility. And Tapestry has been around for numerous years, so it's not a new group that's been around. So again, it has a different feel. Um, and again, that's the nine story being a loft, two story being the assisted memory care facility. And then obviously the Holiday Inn Express really bring itself up to the formula blue design. When you look at the floor plan, that's actually what we're talking about. So again, um, this is sort of what it looks like right now, and then this is what it would look like down the line. So again, where you see the nine story, that would be the Aloft Hotel, and then coming off of Kurt, um, Algonquin Road, um, how they would actually get to the assisted living, and then obviously the Holiday Inn Express. Staff is still talking to obviously this. So just the next few pictures are just to show you what a loft sort of looks like. So a little more in colors, more more flashy. Um, you know, it has a different feel than anything else. So a loft is really known for their colors, their feel, um, and again their design that they actually talk about. Um, it has a different feel to everything else. Assisted living, again, it's just a nice little new look, has a different uh, two-story feel. The blue look um, for the Holiday Inn Express really has a different feel, too. And again, if you haven't seen a Holiday Inn Express lately, again, um, more browns and blues that you see in it, but it's all renovated inside the actual suites. The benefits to the city, it actually does make an indirect and direct. It does talk about um, new employees. Obviously, if the Holiday Inn had to close down, you would lose those positions. Obviously, with this, in between Aloft and the assisted living, you actually have a good product that actually keeps in there. It actually revitalizes and redevelops that area and actually helps the EAV for the area and actually brings in Aloft, which is a Marriott and Starwood product. Um, estimated employees, we talk about with the project and without the project, you do see some additional um, points and obviously they put in construction, we look at those as temporary, but it does have part of the appeal of the project. It's between a seven and a nine million dollar project and I say the seven million dollars because obviously you always talk about loss of cost and I guess when you look at the timeline, that nine story building when it comes offline, you're really talking about a year and a half of construction. So if everything was to stay on their schedule, would it be June of 2019 that the Aloft Hotel would come back online. The assisted living would be September of 2019, and then the Holiday Inn Express really doesn't have any uh, changes at this point in time. So again, it's really bring down hotel motel tax. It would affect a few things, but again, the overall when we're looking at it, it brings in a little better, better redevelopment and a better hotel overall. Yes, the number of rooms go down from what it is at this point in time, but you get a higher quality product, you have a higher rate of those um, rooms. So again, there is a blip, um, about a year and a half um, that we would see. Obviously, we brought the uh, 7B incentive the, to the Economic Development Committee. It was approved. Um, you will see that on the July 25th City Council. Remember, um, it's a recommendation from the Economic Development Committee to the City Council. Um, City Council would make the recommendation to Cook County. It still would need Cook County approval. The 7B is very similar, per se, like a 6B. It's a 12-year um, incentive. The first 10 years, obviously, 10% of the fair market value, then the 11th year at 20% and the 12th, or the 15% for the 11th year and then 20% for the 12th year. And that's really the um, PowerPoint that we wanted to show. Obviously, um, Sam and his team are here if you have more questions. We wanted everybody to feel comfortable with this redevelopment. There are pieces that still need to be done. Obviously, we've already met with them. 
Um, there's still some engineering. There's some other pieces that we need to know. And obviously for the city council, the 7B incentive would be before the city council at the July 25th meeting. Um, and then the Planning and Zoning Commission tentatively has this for the hearing of the September 5th, if everything is uh, filed on time and all the other documents, which would mean that the first reading of this ordinance for this redevelopment would happen on September 26th, with the second reading happening on October 10th. So with that, um, open it up, and as I said before, um, the team is here to answer any additional questions that you might have on this exciting redevelopment. Okay. First off, I want to say thank you, gentlemen, for coming here. And you guys have been very kind to me in the beginning here as I've learned how this is coming up to speed. Uh, to me, it's just a, a star that you're going to put right on Algonquin Road, and hopefully we just keep more and more people wanting to come there. Any questions from the council? Just, just a clarification for me. And, Barry, maybe you can help me with this. In, in one place of the PowerPoint, it said... Uh, IHG will consider renewing a 10-year license. Another one, it says we've signed a 10-year license. Have we signed a 10-year license? The partnership before you with the Holiday Inn Express, they have a 10-year extension. So that's the blue group. The other group with the ALOF, that is going to be the 20-year um, renewal that they will have for that flag. Yeah, and I, I'm just on the Holiday Inn Express. But. Yes, as far as I know, they have signed with the uh, Holiday Inn Express, the group. And, and only because I don't know any better, um, when we, if there's a 7B tax incentive, is that on the entire property? That's what it is filed for the whole entire property. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I, and I also want to say, I, anything that, uh, you know, the, the owners think will make it more attractive and a better proposition for them has to be a better proposition for us. So thank you. There you go. Mr. Diaz, yes. Thank, thank you. Um, I have um, had several meetings with Sam and his group, and I'm very excited. I mean, this is this is what I do. Um, the Holiday Inn Express, that's the, 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 the new version, the blue, um, aloft. Is, is a very up and coming uh, segment in, in our industry and it will uh, generate a lot of new interest from millennials, uh, not so much from the boomer generation, but the millennials will just love it. I mean, the way it's the concept, uh, Barry mentioned about colors, but just the overall feel of it is design. It's, there's nothing in our market Schomburg, Meadows, whatever, like that right now. So the sooner Sam and, his, and, and the rest of his team get that open, the sooner they're going to start making some good money on that building. I'm real excited about that. So um, thank you, Sam. Thank you for, to your partners. Uh, you guys have done a great job. And uh, whatever I can do, um, I'd still certainly like to be a part of it and, and, and talk to you about any questions you might have. So I'm in favor of it 100%. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Any other? Alderman? While this ends this part of it, gentlemen, we wish you Godspeed and the good weather for the next 18 months. So thank you. <laughs> Mr. Crumstock, who is our next candidate for tonight? Um, I'll start this off, and obviously this goes back to when we had a past community, the whole meeting we mentioned we would bring, bring the uh, fiscal year 2018 refuse fund back. Part of it was, um, obviously staff has heard numerous times, could you please bring back a chipper service? Um, we feel at this point in time with the EAB coming near the end, and obviously um, we still do processes with storm damage and some other things. We felt that it was interesting and appropriate for um, Finance Director Melissa Gallagher and I to have the discussion before you see the full um, budget. And again, this is still in the draft working items for the 2018 budget, but we want to show you what the fund looks like right at now. Um, and again, as we mentioned, one-time chipper would be about $40,000. Um, the current rate that we have for the refuse rate is $29.95 per month. Um, that is recycling and refuse. We've had that in place since 2014. Um, we talk about even before that rate um, has been so consistent, 
um, you go back past years, um, and it actually used to be as high as 3250. So part of the discussion that we have with uh, the city council is making sure that we stay within our um, fund balance policy for this fund because it's an enterprise and everything else is between 30 and 50 percent of expenditures, but also making sure that if you feel comfortable with increasing it slightly, um, where would we be if we had increased it per some of the past discussions that we had? Do you feel comfortable with what we're talking about with this, a very slight increase? Um, do you see other items? So again, this is just a working document at this point in time. We want you to feel comfortable with the rate scenarios. We gave you full scenarios just to show you if you were going to wipe out the debt or the deficit that we actually have in this proposed budget and then give you some other ideas as we discuss with that. So with that, I do turn it over to Finance Director Melissa Gallagher just to go over some of the pieces, but this proposed budget is within the fund balance policy. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Crumstock. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to add a few things, really. Uh, City Manager Crumstock has covered that. Um, as we mentioned before, we have a few attachments within this document. We have just a working draft. It's a proposed budget for 2018. It is a working draft. And also we did provide you, and it's in the council packet, um, a working draft of scenarios so that you could see all the different scenarios that uh, with the current charge right now, as, as City Manager Kremsuk has mentioned, $29.95 per month per resident or per home for refuse service, and that includes re recycling as well. Uh, as we've reviewed and forecasted out, staff feels comfortable with a 1% increase to cover a potential residential ref uh, pickup for chip chipper service, so that's a $0.30 cent uh, increase per month for a rate of $30.25 per month. That would bring you to a 31% estimated fund balance, and that would be in parameters. But then again, we, what we did is we went a little further out from 2% all the way up to 9.4%. That 9.4% uh, does fully fund then no deficit in the refuse fund, if you want to call it that, um, just because the expenditures exceed revenues just for 2018 as estimated. We gave you all this information just so you could review it. Uh, as mentioned uh, before, that the refuse rate to less increase was back in 2014. And prior to that, the rate was $29.36, and prior to that was $32.50. Uh, we ran those scenarios just to provide information to City Council. Our estimates for a one time, probably the autumn time frame uh, in 2018 would be about $40,000. And we wanted to look for a little bit of city council direction so that we could provide that in the proposed budget for review, which will come up in August. So we've got a few questions down here at city council direction at the council action summary. Um, we wanted to review all of that with city council tonight, so I'll turn it back over to Mr. Mayor. Thank you. <coughs> First, I'll open it up. Mr. Comstock, do you have anything else to add? No, and again, all that we've done is put in for one-time pickup, and we were looking at late summer, um, autumn for that. The reason that we were talking about doing it at that point in time is it gives us enough time during all of 2018 to advertise that we were doing this spring cleanup, or at this point in time would be a fall-autumn cleanup, but we want to make sure that the word gets out there. Um, and we feel that if we do it late enough in the year, you know, after summer when people can cut and do anything else, it would actually uh, give enough notice so we're not surprising anybody. But again, um, we do have three main questions that we have just looking for those additional pointers. And again, no matter what you do tonight, um, this budget is still within its fund balance policy. Okay, we'll open it up to the uh, questions, gentlemen. No? No. Mr. Oh, I, uh, yeah, I, uh, Mr. Yastis. Thank you. Um, the 1% increase, what does that total come out to? Is that the 29000 That's the 29633 But to do chipper one time would cost 40000 That is correct. So um, my feeling would be that if we're going to add the chipper service, then we should add uh, enough to cover the cost of that. That only seems to make sense. 
my second question is, can we talk to our forestry people and find out when the best time is? Um, I don't know if it's better to trim stuff in the spring or whether it's better to trim stuff in the fall. Uh, whatever <coughs> makes the most sense is when we should probably do it. And we can always let people, residents know um, that this service has been added and when it's going to be added. I don't think we have to wait till the fall to do it unless that's the appropriate time. Uh, I would Mr. defer back to Mr. Volk. I gather you're now at the podium. Yes, I can answer that. Talking with our forestry people, um, we tossed about the spring versus fall, and um, the city forester in particular feels very strongly that we should do as much of our tree replacement planting in the spring because there are more varieties available. Our experiences have been that they've done better, and um, we could certainly go back to a fall planting, which we predominantly did years ago when we did the brush chipping, but uh, um, he feels that the spring planting is better, and uh, that's really the main reason why we considered uh, offering it probably in September, October would be our best months, and then we would limit or eliminate uh, much of the fall planting. Um, Barry certainly correct that uh, if we wait until fall, that gets more time to get it out there for people to prepare for it and get their materials ready. Uh, one of the problems we used to have when we'd start this program in April, May is people said it was too early. They didn't have time to get their materials ready um, in certain areas. And if I remember right, we used to rotate the area, so we did different areas first and different areas last just to do that. So there really isn't a, a right time or a wrong time, but um, at this point we feel that fall would be better, but uh, if there's other reasons that we haven't thought of to do it earlier, we can certainly talk about that and try to fit it in. Okay. Questions oh. answered? Anybody else? Uh, Alder and Hill, please. Yeah, ju just a couple on, uh, just for my understanding of the program. So there, there was a talk some time ago about just how many residents may or may not want to use the service, and once we increase the um, rates, I mean, that's number one on everybody. And number two, if we decide that not enough people are using it and the chipper goes away, I assume the rate will just stay the same and not be, you know, uh, uh, reduced. So uh, working from that premise, um, you say one t one chipper service is forty thousand dollars. Is that does that include one time costs? Are there in, are there um, economies of scale if you do it more than once a year? The Not that we've identified um, to break that down. Um, and years ago, we used to have sites where we could get rid of a lot of our chipper debris at no cost or at minimal cost and those locations and uh, situations have gone away so our basic breakdown was about fifteen thousand dollars for the disposal cost and about twenty to twenty five thousand uh, dollars for the uh, labor and equipment costs uh, based on on current rates so to do it a second time or a third time um, it's still going to cost us whatever it is that we pick up to disposal per. plus the labor to to do that uh, pick up and cycle through the city so roughly forty thousand per event whatever that may be uh, yeah and i guess one logically could th think that if you did it enough that maybe that second pickup and third pickup wouldn't have as much debris but um, you know you're only talking about uh, a couple no, thousand dollars difference probably. To figure out mm -hmm. relative to the rate um, because it, it, i guess it makes a thought process that i was having moot if there is no economies of scale which is kind of a pay-as-you-go system for residents but uh if 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 the numbers are right uh or the conjecture is right that it's not a huge participation rate that's probably cost prohibitive to uh, charge residents um, individually as opposed to putting it through the rate and that's one thing that we really can't measure it's been several years oh, since right. we've had the program right. the uh, participation slowly decreased over a number of years probably from the 1990s right. to you know 2010 roughly when we uh, curtailed and ultimately stopped the program. Um, is there pent-up demand? We don't know. I mean, it's something that would have to and, kind and of was, monitor over a couple of years, probably. All right, thanks, Fred. I, I was, I had asked my uh, colleague, Alderman Cannon, um, as we're both on the Vehicle Replacement Committee, we're good with 
chipper equipment? Mm -hmm. That is correct. Okay. I have no further questions. Thanks. I just that um, brought up one. Uh, having been here for a long period of time, I do remember when we had chippers twice a year and you would rotate them into six or seven different sections, but then you also offloaded a lot of those chips to residents. Is that included in here? Because you could call up and say, you know, I need some chips and I know the park district, schools, churches. Uh, is that factored into that or is that just a difference? We would, these days. we would certainly want to offer it, but mm -hmm. we really don't know what the demand is for it. It has decreased, and uh, our cost estimates are based on disposal of uh, much, if not all of it. If there are windows of opportunity for disposal elsewhere at lower costs or people are looking for chips, uh, we'd certainly be happy to consider it. But then again, that does increase the cost because we've got to deliver it. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Mr. Alderman Kane, I think, was first. Oh, okay. Good. Mr. Okay. Gallo, um, sir. A couple questions and then maybe some information to share as well. The first thing was we, we had this initial conversation some months back about mm -hmm. um, chipper service. I sent out a preliminary survey just to kind of put it out there and see what residents thought, primarily Ward 4. And then after I received the feedback, I shared it. Um, but to remind everybody, and this is just a snapshot, and maybe we can extrapolate from this, or it could be completely off. But of the survey recipients, there were whoever received it, 184 people responded to the survey. And then of that, um, 164 of them said yes, they'd like it. And it was just three simple questions. Would you like chipper service? If so, how many times a year? And then what ward, just so I could have that data back. And then the next step would be obviously, well, we found out now that it's going to cost something. So those who are now engaged with this information will take it back and further that. Um, but the resounding responses were from those 184 people, 179 of them said they'd like it twice per year versus once a year. And then the feedback with their wards. Um, but then financial regard, we had a, a position that has since um, been, um, I don't know, extinguished uh, community director development, director development, um, economic development, I think it, what it was, or community, community development, development drawing, director. drawing a blank. But with that, we're opening a new position for business advisor um, for a different salary. And so as a result, there's a, a difference remaining in the budget as well. Is that, so is that What I would tell you, too, is now you're talking two different funds. Yeah, General sure. fund General is over fund. there. Refuse fund is over here. Okay. So the salaries that were mentioned are only the people who are working out of the refuse fund. Mm -hmm. Can we interchange money between those funds if there is a... We can, but again, remember, we don't try doing these two things just for one-offs, and that's what this would be, a one-off, because when the budget comes out for general fund, the general fund has to support a lot more items that will be coming up. And when you see the 2018 budget, we are increasing, you know, community events. We're trying to put in for a comprehensive plan. We are putting more pieces, so there is more stress on that to even do some of these other transfers. Okay. That, that answered my question. Yeah, okay. Mr. Cannon, I believe you were next up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Fred, if you, can you answer a question for me? If we do go ahead and do this program, what will your department not do because they're doing this? Because I assume this is extra workload. They're working every day right now. What won't get done if they yeah, do this? We're not planning additional staff for, for this, and um, it likely would be in the area of block trimming, tree, parkway tree trimming, that we would uh, defer some of that um, because that typically is what we would be doing in the fall. If we didn't do planting, we'd be doing block trimming. So, so would, know, we, would we go to an outside contractor and get that work done? Well, it's something we would have to look at, and that's something that we appreciate the increases in that funding in, in the past to be able to do that to try to catch up and keep up with what is required. But uh, when we did bring a report several months ago to the committee with regards to our overall comprehensive forestry program, that is something that we are rec going to be recommending in future years is to increase the um, contractual services for that. So it's all kind of part of the picture. If we take several weeks off and don't block trim, yeah, there's a couple of streets that we won't get done that uh, we either need to defer till the next year with our own forces or would have to um, add to a contract. So there would be a cost factor to that. We, we can't measure that right now. There but, would if we want to keep up with the work cost. that we wouldn't get done, yes. Because I'm guessing to do this program, you're looking at least a couple weeks in the street or yeah. more or more. 
from the past, it typically was a week, four or five days per area, and there's four areas. So yeah, it would tie up um, a goodly part of four weeks for roughly three employees. Okay, you know, I, I think everybody knows exactly where I feel about the chipper program. I think, in my opinion, we're going down the wrong road. Um, we've survived quite well for five years without it. Um, to my knowledge, anybody can chop up a tree right now and put it in a proper bundle on a corner, and it will be picked up right now. To my knowledge, and I could be wrong on my numbers, but no, one's to, to, no one called me and said they disputed my numbers from the last time, that only about 15% of the people use this service. So 85% of the people will have some kind of a raise if we could decide to go with the raise of the fund to fund 15%, which I don't think is fair in my opinion. Many, many people in every ward of this city have landscape service that does this work for them already. So they have no need or desire for this service. So there's a couple things there that I think are really important for people to realize. I mean, you know, as, as a side note to this, you know, the last two years I've asked for an increase in vehicle sticker things. And because it was $40,000, it was turned down. And people said, I don't want to raise taxes, but they don't seem to have any problem raising $40,000 here. And if you look at the, the road budget we're going to be talking about shortly, that could be another court we do every year. I mean, we all know we have a huge deficit in streets, but yet here we're talking about raising taxes, in essence, or fees, even though we are the highest garbage rate in the northwest suburbs, the highest, bar none. I think Barrington's almost equal to us, but everybody else is at least $10 a month less than us or more. And yet here we are going for even a higher increase. And I guess from a cost standpoint, one of the things that really concerned me looking at this, you know, um, last year we, just start, we started using our own transfer station. I'm not sure what month that happened, Fred. Could you refresh my memory? It was July 1st of 2016. Okay. So I'm really confused when I look at the numbers here that we have for salary, um, for pension, for benefits, for health. I see all those numbers going up. But yet, since last year, we now don't send our trucks over to Glenview every day. So to my knowledge, and Fred, you can correct me if I'm wrong, we save about an hour per trip per day per truck. Ballpark. It's a good ballpark. Okay. So on a normal week, and, and we have three trucks on the street most days, right? Normally, yes. And is that, and are those all garbage trucks or is one of those um, uh, brush pickup? One of them is brush pickup from uh, April to Okay, but my point is at least two of the trucks are off, are off the street now at least 10 more hours per week, if not more. And I don't see any of that reflection at all in here. So those people are supposed to, when they come in, to my knowledge, as we've been told in the past, we've always been told when they come in, they check out of garbage when they're done with their job, and they check in the streets. But yet, our budget's still going up dramatically. Well, not dramatically, but every year it's going up. I don't see any reflection of all of that cost savings that we had in personnel that we had since last July. None of it's reflected in the numbers, nothing. And every one goes up because of the salary increase, every one of the other categories goes up along with it. And I, I'm really kind of taken aback that no one picked up on that and we're not getting any acknowledgement of that in the fund. I mean, I would question, even if I lose and we do the chipper service, why are we increasing anything? There should be a dramatic cost savings with the personnel cost alone. 10 hours oh. of trips that they don't need to make every well, week at least. But we're still yeah. utilizing them for the services. So but they, but they, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Crumpstock, don't they, when they're done with their refuge job for the day, don't they punch out of that department and then punch into streets and sand, streets? We, we don't punch one way or another. We assign them to another project. So, and they're still being, still so being we're paid not out doing refuge? true, yeah, we're not doing true up, meaning you did seven hours here, you did one hour over here, so now the general fund needs to support the refuse fund by one hour. We don't do that. We keep them in where they're being paid out of specifically. So even if we have someone working in utilities who's going to be working, let's say, on streets for something, we're not having the general fund reimburse the utilities for that work. Once they're assigned to a designated fund, all the work that they're doing is specifically out of that fund. We might be having them do street work, but we're not having the general fund reimburse that fund what they're doing. 
Okay, I was wrong in that. I didn't realize that. I thought you, I thought you had said in the past that we act, they actually punched out and punched in the other thing. That we was don't my understanding. Do true up at this point in time. And there's a variety to... of tasks that they do. Mm -hmm. Some of them are street related. Many of them, in fact, are street related. But some of them involve litter collection and uh, equipment maintenance and the like. So it is kind of a split between streets and refuse. I don't know if it's 50, we, 50, 70, 30. But uh, we certainly could run some numbers. But uh, we haven't. No, I, I, I don't want you to do extra if you work look on at that. Task budgets. That. That's where we're, our accountants and our auditors used to have problems with. With. And it goes way past that we used to try to do that true up, and then it became sloppy, and that's where the accountants and the auditors said, no, you keep them over here, or you are going to be actually giving every little thing, and that's why once you're assigned to a fund, that's what we're paying you out of. So we pull people from all different kinds of work to do certain things, but they're still being paid out of that fund. It's also about the seasonals. You know, we might start them in a fund, but then you see the seasonals working in the streets, or you might see them working utilities. But again, we don't do that. Here you did an hour over here, here you did. Okay, fair and enough. Again, that goes back into, we've been doing that for years now because the auditors and the accountants were starting to look at that and question every little thing that we were doing. Okay. I guess the other comment I would make just about the whole cost structure, I would assume that somewhere along the line we're gonna have to say, you know, our cost of vehicles has to go down if we're driving 5,000 miles less per vehicle a year, even if they're not as hard as miles as the pickup, there has to be a cost savings to the city somewhere. And with those vehicles being hundreds of thousands of dollars, I think we could be looking at a lot of savings if they have an eight year life cycle and we're saving over eight years, 40,000 miles worth of driving. That's got to be a pretty dramatic change in the way we cost out that, that aspect of it. But and again, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I just, you know, I, I'm really, I'm really puzzled why we would add forty thousand dollars of cost to something that fifteen percent of the people use, but yet we won't add forty thousand dollars worth of cost on an area where we all need help. It just it boggles my mind. It's just I'm really confused by it. But I appreciate you listening to me. Thank yeah. you. If I could, the equipment maintenance is a good topic that I expect we'll talk about at a future vehicle replacement committee. Now that we've got a year into that program, we can start to do some measuring in terms of the effects of uh, less miles. On the other hand, the miles that were driven were easier miles and the uh, starting and the stopping of um, picking up picking up the refuse in the yard waste. But uh, we will be able to put some data together. I've expected a future vehicle replacement committee meeting on that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bill. Any other questions? Uh, Alderman Jenkins. Thank you. Um, I was just curious, uh, Alderman Gale, did on, on your survey, mm -hmm. did you say that you did ask some of the residents about like what they thought if a cost increase or anything? Was there a response to that? Didn't no, care. I said there was the undefined cost right now, but right. just feedback. And then if there were to be a cost associated, we have their engagement, and now we can ask the questions again, knowing a a a real cost because there was no tangible numbers before. Okay, so we we didn't just ask them in general. Yeah. If I was just curious, mm -hmm. if okay, because I was just I was just kind of looking at two at Arlington's you know, waste and all that and garbage and because I know Alderman Cannon is saying that we're the highest and stuff, but I also know that some other municipalities like Arlington Heights charges $2.65 for a landscape waste sticker and you total all those things up and they charge a $30.45 $30 electronics pickup fee where our, our, our pickup and stuff, they pick up everything and anything and there's no extra fees and no bag fees and all that. So, but, um, but that's going off on the stickers or the chipper. I was just curious um, if anybody had said anything about they didn't care if there'd be a little increase or not. So thank you. Oh. Alderman Cannon. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Mayor. I, I guess the other, the other thought I would have, you know, in light of the discussion that I just, you know, presented, um, you know, if we're really think we should go down this line and in light of the, the small amount of people that actually use the surface, why don't we consider a fee for service? And let the let the fifteen percent of the people that rethink really they need this and want it, the hundred and seventy nine people, great, have it and charge them whatever we think our cost is, whether it's fifty dollars a pickup or a hundred dollars a pickup, whatever it might be. Because I don't think eighty five percent of the people should pay for what fifteen percent of the people use. So let the people who use it okay. pay for it. Just as a thought. All right, thank you. Mr. Gallo. First. All I mean, Kenny, it was just a just to clarify that, that one seventy nine was just a small pocket of those who were on you know, community chatter. So it doesn't represent uh, a larger pool, it's just a small segment that were had eyes on it. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Mr. 
Bill. Yeah, and uh, I appreciate uh, Alderman Cannon's remarks. In fact, uh, in, in my initial comments, I, I said that I was thinking along those lines, but at $40,000 for a one-time event, and the numbers are as low as, as you stated, 10, 15 percent, uh, I think it's going to be quite cost prohibitive for people to do uh, uh, individual fees for that service. Any other comments? Uh, my only thought is that I have uh, supported this in the past. I've heard numbers that are um, higher than what Alderman Cannon has brought forth, but everyone can work with what they have. And I've heard from the residents because it's not just the residents who use it that benefit, it's the residents who have neighbors and who have areas of the city where they're always concerned and don't have uh, landscaping that uh, they'd like to be able to, you know, maybe <clears throat> clean up some areas and it adds, uh, used to add a great deal of pride to our city. So that's my only thought. I, I've heard what the, the aldermen have had to say, so I would uh, support it. So, Mr. Crumstock, you just need direction on whether we, we just need go a, again direction, and we have three questions at the bottom, but right. um, one would be moot if you did something else. So. Right. So the first question is: Will the inclusion of an estimated estimate for one-time residential chipper pickup service does the city council desire to include this item, approximately forty thousand dollars, in the fiscal year twenty eighteen proposed budget? Um, all in favor, please show hands. It's liquid, right? The budget's liquid at this point. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's mm -hmm. liquid. We have four. Where's the four? Three. Where's the four? Three. You're not, you can't, you're can't vote. Can't vote. <laughs> I go for it. All those opposed? Three to three. Three to three. So we'll go forward to the next meeting until we have a full uh, full council at this time. So just continue to bring it forward. Two more questions. Yeah, two yes. more questions yes. on the list. And does the city council desire to increase the refuge rate per staff recommendation from 30 to, from 29.95 per month to 30.25 per month? All those in favor, aye. Aye. Three, four, four. Three, three. Three, three. three to three, okay. And does the city wish, council wish to review other rate increase scenarios as presented in the rate scenario attachment? Um, all in favor? Do go forward with other scenarios? Are you saying, high, are you saying yeah. higher rates? Does, does, does what, it, what, what, what yeah. do, you, do you, I mean, does the, does the council wish to review other rate increase scenarios? In other words, do you want to just, we could just like do it at 30 cents? Okay, do you, does anyone have? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I do. Okay. Uh, um, go ahead. The, I don't know, the very first question was difficult to answer without knowing what we like in the last two. Right. Because I certainly am not in favor of something that's not going to be funded, number one. Uh, number two is that uh, if we don't know participation rates, are they 10 and 15 percent or are they 80 percent? Because 80 percent, to me, creates a very real scenario of if you want it as an individual, you pay for it as an individual. Um, because I think then it gets into a reasonable cost range. So it's, it's very... I don't want people to read into the vote more than they should. It's very difficult to answer one without the other two. So that's that's the basis behind my votes. So now the, are the rate the rate key scenarios what, one percent, two percent, three percent, or is it one percent, two percent, three percent individual pay? No, the, the one, rate one. scenarios that were produced were one, two, three, three point five. Those are really the ones that you have in front of you. So I guess the question is, does anyone on the council want to propose a higher rate than what city has, pro has proposed at 30 cents to make it to 30.25? I, so, I, I thought what, we didn't, I thought, just, that, just voted that I thought they got right. voted down. Well, what we, what we talked about is we're going forward because we're at 3-3 three, three tie at the moment. Because with the, you know, we deciding whether we're going to go to the 40,000, it's three, three, four, three for it, and three against it, and then does the so city that, council. So that's die? a loss. Yes. Yeah, so does the city council? Yes. 
Go Thank ahead. you. Um, these three questions, if you were following along, uh, the first two are in regards to the chipper service. The third one is kind of a bigger deal. Right. If you noticed on our budget, we've got deficit spending this year of 194 grand. That 9.4 percent increase is to to zero out that deficit. So that's kind of a big deal. I don't think we're here tonight to, f at least I'm not here tonight to to pick amongst uh, five different choices. What I would like to see staff do is uh, th that's a fairly condensed uh, budget. I understand this is a working draft of next year's proposed budget. It's fairly condensed. Uh, contractual services, for example, uh, wh what's the $86,000 of increased spending which leads to a large portion of that $194,000 deficit? Well, I probably want more information on, on this. Um, and and possibly some suggestions from staff, which I think is what they're looking for, um, as far as can we cut anything out of this out of this budget that w will make it easier for myself at least to make a decision as it, as it stands with our proposed budget, uh, we're hitting the bottom of our fund balance policy. So I don't. I don't want. I personally don't feel prepared to make a decision uh, on uh, the third third portion of this about uh, reviewing rate increase scenarios. I mean, I guess I do. Yeah, bring me those rate increase scenarios. Tell me what exactly we're doing with a with a sixty cent increase, a ninety cent increase, a, a buck five. Also on the other side, what can we trim out of our budget? What can we, like Mr. Cannon suggested, what savings can we realize? If I, I don't want to get uh, accounting wise, like Barry s said, I don't want to make this complicated and charge back uh, for for when they're when they're working in other city departments. That sounds very complicated and and just not worth it. But I'd like more information on this deficit spending. Um, if we could tighten that up, then our decision will be fairly simple, or at the very least it will be less painful for residents who pay for garbage. Um, so question number three, do we wish to review other rate increase scenarios? Sure. I need a lot more information, though. So that's that's my piece. Thanks. Alderman Diestas. Thank you. Uh, as an enterprise fund, which I think this is, then the amount that we charge should cover everything. We shouldn't have to be, mm -hmm. we shouldn't have to be uh, su supplementing, and deficit, supplementing spending. and deficit spending. And I thought that's how we uh, had originally arranged it. So I don't know how we went into deficit spending on this, especially to the tune of $200,000 a year. Yeah, and um, part of that is when we started transferring money to the refuse fund, part of that is also when we started um, with some new contracts, but also starting the chargebacks that we never had in refuse fund itself. Okay. And then also remember, as a council, we used to get the transfer station money into this fund. We sent that over to the general fund because the general fund needed the money at this point in time. So you add a lot of those kind of items. That's why this fund has been uh, so deficit spending for some time. Thank you, sir. And then I, I have to agree 100% with Mr. Banger. Um, I'm right now not prepared to to make a decision on the third question until we get some more information. And at that point in time, we may I may say, uh, you know, we need to raise it enough to so that it's self-sufficient. Um, but I think we need more information on that right now. And I think I agree with Mr. Cannon as well. Uh, if we're saving better than an hour a day and drive time, uh, so there's going to be some gas savings there. There's going to be some labor savings there. There's a whole pile of savings that I think we need to explore and get more details on. Um, you may not be transferring funds around, but, I mean, couldn't you just do it and... and in the backside, uh, in just accounting, and 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 make a change like that, and allocate it appro allocate it appropriately. That's when the accountants and the auditors were starting to say that we were not truthful at what we were doing because again, 
they want a clean budget and they want a clean that's so fine that's, that's let them say what they want to but if we're saving an hour a day uh, and we're saving a couple hours a day that's 10 hours a week plus gas over the course of a year that's a significant amount of money that i don't care what the accountant says we need to have our books reflect the true expenditures by department that's my feeling and I would let them give us a hit on that because then we know how much exactly we're spending in each department again just my, my feelings uh, Ms. Gallagher go ahead. if I can add to the conversation as well Alderman Diasis and um, in what uh, uh, City Manager Barry Crumstock is mentioning is we do have administrative chargebacks within that fund and right now this is a working draft so we're listening to everything that you're saying and when we present the proposed budget, we can bring back some of these pieces. So this is just an initial start of it. The administrative chargebacks, that is in there. And that's where we do do the incremental changes. So that's where that flow does go through. But at the same point, what Mr. Crumstock is mentioning is we need to budget where the salary and benefits are. And that's something that all the accounting rules will state that you have to do it that way. However, we have the cost allocation side, which we don't have to go into here, but you'll see that within the budget. So I just wanted to add to that. Okay. Yes, Alderman Cannon. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Mayor. In light of the fact that we haven't come to a conclusion tonight, I guess I would ask uh, staff if they would consider coming back with a fee-for-service proposal of what it might cost us if we had the 15% of the people that use the service, how much it would cost per pickup, well, either a ballpark, a high-low, whatever. Or 25 or 50 percent of people. Yeah. Well, no one's, no one's, you know, it, Mr. Mayor, no one's disputed. The, I've made this statement twice in public now. No one said my number's wrong. I'm not saying it's absolutely correct, okay. but no one said it's wrong either. Okay. So, I mean, if someone comes back with a different number, I'm all ears, but no one's done that yet. All right. Alderman Hill. That's true, but uh, Alderman Gallo has done something that suggests it might be higher. I'm not going to say that uh, that's a statistically <coughs> valid survey, but uh, because it certainly didn't in, include cost, but there certainly is information to be had in a sensitivity analysis where it says, if 10% participated, the rate would be this, if 25 that, if 40 some other number, then we can get our arms around what we may think is cost prohibitive or not, compared to, for example, as you pointed out, Landscape, private landscape or services that are in, in vogue now. So. so I gather you've heard from uh, council mm -hmm. that they would like more information. Yep. And I would ask any uh, specific questions that you specific questions that council have that they would email them to uh, staff so that they can have specific questions before the next meeting. Is that? Yep. That's okay. Right. That's, is that what you need, folks? Yep. Yes. We have. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Crumstock? Um, I'm just next. kicking this off because uh, Public Works Director Fred Vogt and uh, Assistant Director Rob Horn are going to run at least the first one, uh, number three, the street condition survey. This is part two from what we had recently at the April Cow, and then obviously this will also ducktail back into number four when Finance Director Melissa Gallagher will be back. But with that, we go back into street condition discussion. Thank you, Barry. I'm here just about every year around this time, uh, sometimes a little later, sometimes a little earlier, to discuss the um, next year's street program, which is really kind of a kickoff to that. Um, last year, in uh, November of 2016, uh, our city engineer, along with public work staff, um, performed a um, street condition survey of all city streets and uh, we've used that uh, information in putting together the um, future programs projected obviously based on um, revenues or what costs you know are going to be what monies are going to be available to uh, do a street improvement program um, for the last couple of years we've made efforts to either do a street resurfacing program per year, depending on the funding, or a street reconstruction program, or a combination of two, as we were able to do this year with the um, funding of up, you know, approximately 1.8 million that was uh, allocated for both resurfacing and reconstruction. We have two contracts that are currently um, in the latter stages and about to finish up. 
Looking forward to the 2018 street program and uh, some of the discussions we've had just uh, with the Capital Improvements Committee in terms of uh, the spring and summer looking at uh, street program needs. Um, certainly the discussion has centered around the fact that uh, we do need um, and pr would uh, recommend consideration of uh, up to the 1.8 million as we've funded this year. but. Without knowing at this time what monies truly will be available as we start to go through the budget process, um, staff has provided an A and a B scenario here in our staff report um, regarding should there only be roughly a million to a million two hundred thousand dollars available for street improvements, um, we would recommend next year a roughly seven hundred eight hundred thousand dollar street resurfacing program from a maintenance standpoint, and the remaining three hundred to five hundred thousand would. Uh, go into uh, reconstruction, we would continue basically with um, year two of our, what we identified last year as a th three-year program to um, reconstruct streets in the Arlingdale subdivision and then in the um, Jessica, Kevin, Michael area, Quentin Ridge, just to the east of that um, and would need to decide based on the actual funding whether we would complete the areas west of Quentin Road or complete the areas next year east of Quentin Road. Scenario B then would uh, be if up to $1.8 million becomes available for 2018, um, each of our street resurfacing and reconstruction programs would be recommended at roughly eight hundred twenty-five dollars to $925,000. We provided street listings here, and I caution that uh, you know those are just to plug numbers in based on what the street ratings are, what the needs are, um, as well as uh, geographic considerations, contractor mobilizations, and those costs are reflected as best we can determine of uh, an early bidding cycle as uh, we've been successful to do in the last couple of years and have seen that the costs come in rather advantageous to us if we are um, looking at awarding a contract uh, very early in the spring. From a staff recommendation at this point, um, we certainly want to just remind council that uh, the earlier we get this program going, the better. Um, the engineering services are always the first thing to start. If we can um, at least have some direction by, say, September in terms of a, a program dollar amount, uh, we would develop with the city engineer a proposal to do the design engineering services. Um, certainly there's nothing really wrong with going with a higher amount in terms of the engineering services if the intent would be that uh, if the money's made available for the actual construction are less than what we project we could push that uh, engineering effort um, on to the following year into 2019 without really losing anything we've had discussions before about well how good it, or how fresh do engineering uh, efforts and design on these streets last? And uh, generally, we would say two to three years, um, given given those efforts. So, if we know early enough that uh, the monies aren't going to be there and we need to do a lesser program, then we would certainly recommend doing uh, lesser engineering to to do a smaller program. Um, there isn't a really a right or wrong answer; just uh, one from a timing to. Um, get started with that in September or October. And then lastly, item C, which is Kirchhoff Road resurfacing. Unfortunately, as uh, we're meeting tonight, I still don't have, we don't have a definitive answer as to whether the federal funding will be available um, in 2018 for that um, roadway resurfacing from the federal government, the Northwest Municipal Con Conference has had several meetings to deliberate the changes that um, the Chicago Metropolitan Area for Planning are making to the methodologies for federal fund use. And I think we're in good shape and we'll ultimately get the monies programmed for 2018, but I certainly can't promise that at this point. But it is looking favorably based on recent meetings. Um, their next meeting is at the end of August and hopefully we would have some direction uh, before we get into September on whether that is going to happen in 2018 or have to be deferred to a later date. So somewhere along the line if Kirchhoff Road is federally funded we would have to um, determine how that uh, local four hundred to five hundred thousand dollars is uh, to fit into either the roadway resurfacing uh, for local streets or the reconstruction uh, at that time. So that's where we are right now. Thank you, Mr. Pope. Uh, before we go to, I think you have put a, a number of uh, city council input and direction on electronic page number 55 for those following around. But are there any other questions before we go down to that 
section from what Mr. Volt has brought forth. Okay, so Mr. Crumstock, I is this, I gather this would be what we call the city's wish list here. It would be, and it's opening the same discussion that we've had before, and it also it sets the stage for that next discussion that we're also having, and that's why Melissa is at the yep, podium again. That's why so. again, once a place center to show you what we could do, but also re-emphasizing what we've done in the past that. We really should be making a decision sometime in September, October, the latest, so we can um, have the city engineer start producing the documents that we need. So then in January, February of 2018, we are actually out to bid for these projects. And again, like we've been seeing now that um, most of the projects are being done um, on IDOT pr programs, a lot of these contractors are more eager and more aggressive. So the bids have come in a little bit better. So we're hoping that 2018 will be that way too. Um, but again, um, this is really just the uh, place setter for the next discussion that we're having. Okay, so the uh, I think what we'll do is we'll go down and tonight is just giving you some information. soft inf information of where you would like, uh, council would like some more hard information um number one number one question you have up here is should the city review its outstanding debt and plan to issue debt for road projects or were yeah you just jumped to number you, four you jumped to the next topic because oh, it's sorry. electronic page 36 right. are the questions we're talking about okay. sorry yeah. don't know it went to the we're there I was just trying to move the meeting along, Andrew, but it didn't work, it didn't, it didn't work that way. Okay. you because uh, we've had discussions about doing a million and we had discussions mm -hmm. about we'd like to do a million eight a year uh, I guess the question is um, we're funding this off of our property taxes but there's also going to be discussion farther down concerning and I think that's why yeah I think that that's why it's a good time to actually move into the next discussion about local roads because that's will drive some of our um, additional discussion from the street conditions because again we're putting this out here with ideas concepts and what we could do but unless we really um, talk about the other issues in local roads then some of this becomes moot so mr can uh, thank you mr mayor uh, barry or melissa both of you uh, I guess the, just the general question I would ask is, could you possibly give us a scenario how we can get to 1.8 or 2 million? Is that is it possible to kind of give a, a big view? I'm not trying to pin you down. Just is it po I guess there's, the there's first always, question I would ask, is it possible? Okay, so there's always possibilities, but it's using reserves from other funds. So now we're playing with, um, and it, go, it goes back to, and um, most people on the council have heard me say this pitch before. Um, we've never stopped doing capital improvement. That's all capital. So underground, streets, whatever you want to call it. Some municipalities actually stopped that during some of the lean years, and they brought up their reserves, and they brought up some of their other pieces. We've been slowly making sure that our revenues are keeping up, but we've never stopped with capital improvements. We have a lot of capital improvements that are in the queue. You can also look at the Baxter Woodman study that says there's all this utility work that needs to be done. You can look at many years that we've talked about street work to do catch up in some of those. So there are some bonds that will be falling off and we can re um, allocate some money. But at the same point in time, this goes back to the philosophy of many years we've been talking about could you increase this revenue or could you fund it a different way so your quick question is there a way to make it sure 
Is it something that I feel comfortable with? Not. But if the council says, no, we're going to use reserves anywhere to plug this hole, but that's where we're going to be doing. We're going to be plugging a hole that still exists. But at the same point in time, if the council also has the commitment that says we will continue increasing revenues and we're going to get to that point in time, then I can tell you as staff we're comfortable making that decision. So I know that's a long-winded answer well, to your I, question. I, I appreciate your, your answer, but that's not where I was coming from. My, my, where I was coming from, I'm not asking you to, to act shady or to, to steal money from one well, to do shady. the other. But every, I'm just saying, you know, I'm not asking you to do something that's not absolutely what you and Melissa would like to do because you guys have done a magnificent job of getting the numbers out here so we all understand. I'm not asking you to change things. I'm just asking you, is there a scenario you see without playing games, without shuffling stuff, where we could realistically say as a group, can we see 1.8? Or should we really be thinking 900,000 or 900,000 plus Kirchhoff? Whatever you want to, however you want to phrase it is fine. I'm just looking for how do we get the revenue to do, we all know we got a ton of street work to do. I don't think there's anybody here that would disagree with that thought. How do we get more money without being shady to just get this, get more money into the funds and have you two happy on top of it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's um, without going to another municipality. <laughs> I'm delicately answering that. The feeling is, um, and just for people at home, there is no sh shadiness, and we don't do it. We reallocate and other sorts. I, I know. I'm, I'm, just, solid. I'm sorry. It just what we have in revenue at this point in time to allocate 1.8 in streets is not healthy and that's why we're running so as staff wise what i would tell you at this point in time staff is uncomfortable doing a 1.8 million dollar project with the revenue that we have without doing reallocation without doing transfers but if the council wants to do a program then staff would be recommending that you're going to bond to do a catch-up like what we did before, putting less pressure on the funds, specifically local road fund, so we can increase our revenues. So then we're at a point in time that we would feel comfortable and not be running into, hey, are you doing one thing or another? Um, I think that the council has heard numerous times what is a good number for catch up for roads? It could be five million. It could be three million. Um, five to six is really that comfort level, but you also have Baxter Woodman study with underground. So my feeling is, and again, this is getting way past the local road discussion, if you are going to bond, you're going to bond for a bunch of infrastructure. And that's how it would be declared if you're going to keep this. And again, that's my feeling. I know that Melissa's behind and she could, but um, 1.8 is not sustainable at this point in time unless you do some of the increases. And certain municipalities have dedicated other revenues, and that's what you see in the report with uh, natural gas, with uh, video gaming, with all those other scenarios to increase those revenues to balance it. Slowly, um, the city council has followed staff that we've been putting property taxes higher for local roads to make sure it's supported. And you are correct. Every year that you've sat on the council, we've talked about vehicle stickers. Um, and we've talked about increasing that. And you've also heard from staff, um, we would love to get out of the vehicle sticker program and just increase it some other way because we go through all that. But I know that's another long-winded <coughs> way to get to the answer, but again, comfort level what we would be recommending is bringing down the 1.8 to a more manageable number as our revenues continue to grow so we can have a full funded fund so would you guess that somewhere by the end of the summer you might come back and kind of give us another ballpark number that the comfort level would be at or i'm not trying to push at a date but what you know what what time frame are you looking at where we can say as a council okay here's the money that we have, we'll make the program work around what we have, because that's obviously what we have to do. I think that 
again, what we've shown in this projection is to try to show you where we are right now. So if everything just stayed at the same at a $1.8 million project, we have a ne negative fund balance. I understand. And that's what staff is trying to say. If you want us to show it, that's what we're going to not show because we don't want to show it, which means that $1.8 million budget needs to come down to eliminate that zero. Now, if the council says, no, we also want you to use some reserves, we will carefully reallocate in a healthy way if we can. But that's also starting down that way that we've also tried not being dependent on reallocation. We did that with the refuse fund one year, and you know you can see that we're right at the 30% right now. So the comfort level is where do we sit at the end of the day? Okay, so I guess I would just ask you, whenever you and Melissa think it's appropriate, if you come back with a number that, that's livable. I guess the last comment I would make, um, you know, there has been some discussions that kind of relate to this in a way. You know, there's been some rumors about the Dominic's property, about something may be happening there. I, I guess I would just ask the broad question, is it really prudent for us to be redoing Kirchhoff Road if we're going to have major construction in that area any time in the next year or two? I mean, I can tell you from living out near the Arlingdale project, which is a lot smaller than building anything that might be happening over there, I mean, there's a huge amount of truck traffic, and those are not light little trucks. And it just it would be, I think it would be unprudent for us to put a brand new surface down there and have heavy duty trucks running back and forth for months. Just as a thought, just an opinion. Thank you. And yeah, we've talked about that for several years in terms of what's. The best time for Kirchhoff Road to be resurfaced, how long can we wait, how long can we continue to patch it, what's its appearance, what does it do to um, the appearance of you know the downtown area. Yeah, if I had my way, I'd have that Dominic site redeveloped before we did the resurfacing, but I'm not sure how at this point that we know how long, how much longer we can wait. Um, I'm kind of of the opinion now with uh, the differences that are coming forward in the next year or two with regards to the federal dollars being reallocated in this particular area may have a drop in the revenues provided. Um, I would prefer to try to do everything we can to get that money and get that resurfacing done if we can do it in 2018 so that we don't risk losing it if we say, well, we want to wait till 2019 or 2020 and then there is a risk that we won't get it then. There isn't a right answer, but kind of have to be calculated with it. Yeah, I, I just want to piggyback a little bit on Alder McCannon. I, I think his uh, initial question was spot on. And and for more reasons than, than I've heard discussed so far. I mean, we've all read the... Uh, reports on what's going on in Springfield. We've all read that there's reductions here and freezes there and no more appropriations, you know, to cities and municipalities. And so it becomes a, it becomes a really big deal to not look at items uh, in isolation. Because let's take bonds, for example. Yeah, we, you know, it'd be a great idea to do bonds for streets and I, I agree with Ms. Cannon. Let's let's all say the physical um, street condition survey and everything says we got to do something, and we got to do it relatively quickly. But if you do it for bonds, don't forget that there could be another very significant bond request coming down line very quickly. And just how far do we want to go with how many bonds we we've seen this we've seen this picture before? All right, so how far do we want to go with that? Um, I just think there's so much uncertainty right now with, you know, decreases in MFT and freezes here and freezes there that it does become a more encompassing picture and says, okay, if you, if you want to do roads, you know, it becomes the balancing act, right? Um, in, my, in my previous job, my my job was to determine how much revenue a fairly large corporate company needed. And it started with, what does the state allow us for profit? 
what are our expenses, that's the revenue we need. And, and Mr. Cannon is right on, spot on, in looking at it that way. He says, all right, if we do this, but we're also doing this over there, and we're also doing that over there, what revenues do we need? How much bonds can we really go out before our rating is changed? You know, and that's, you know, it's, it, it's, it's almost impossible to begin to look at some of these things in isolation. So, so I, just, I just want to uh, support Mr. Cannon in his request to get a little more information on, on how we can balance these balls in the air. That, that's where I'm at. Thank you. Uh, I'll read Andrew. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Mr. Cannon, for teasing that information out of Mr. Crumstock. In terms of minus $1.6 million, when I saw that, my jaw dropped. And, and so when he says, when he says their preference would be not the $1.8 million, I, I feel bad for Fred because he's looking for an answer to what this, he wants an actual number. So we could either say, Two hundred thousand dollars, and then we're not doing any deficit spending. But I don't think that's the right answer. I I, I looked I looked at this over the weekend, and I, I was trying to puzzle over these numbers. Um, and my vote, if it comes to us voting, unless we want to kick this, as you suggest, to get more information, uh, would be go with the, the one uh, with the one million dollar uh, spending plan, just so we're not wasting money on additional engineering because even though Fred says those have a shelf life I think we'd be crazy to do a 1.8 million dollar uh, spending the streets program this year so I think we should be realistic and realistic in my opinion it'll still be deficit spending um, would be 1 million when I first got here in 2011 our vaunted 1 million dollar streets program it was down to a half million. Is that? Do you remember that? Yes, it was a half. It was down to a half million. So, and we kept referring to it as a million dollar, our million dollar program. And it was, and it was weird. And I, I, I want to say it was uh, Alderman Diastas who finally just tried to train us to say it's not the million dollar street plan anymore. It's the half million dollar street plan. And we worked really hard these past couple of years to get it up to the point it was. We went, lo we went big last year, and we, we sloshed some funds in there that were unanticipated if you remember we we had some big real estate transactions and we said wow we've got extra engineering services let's just do those streets so to maintain the 1.8 million dollars i i thought along would be unrealistic it might it might keep us on track with that with that five-year streets program that we had which took a lot of time to do, and, and it would be nice to maintain the pace of that, but I think with this budget, just sifting through it over the weekend, completely unrealistic. Um, and, I, and I would say it almost looks unrealistic to, and you can't anticipate those little bumps from, from the random real estate transactions uh, in the city. I, I would say it's, it's only fair for us to give some direction to Fred. My suggestion is going to be a $1 million plan, so we're still doing something, um, and and with direction to staff to, uh, I guess our term usually is sharpen your pencils, and, and bring back some, some more figures and more creative suggestions on how to balance this, balance this out. Uh, item number uh, five on the, on the agenda, mm -hmm. to dial in the, balance, the fund balance. I thought that was kind of funny because here we are dealing with a humongous deficit and that that I was I, I forgot to uh, you know talk to Barry about that just I, I don't want to talk about that tonight at all because we, we've got we've got some big chunks of change in my opinion that we need to be dealing with before we even think about <coughs> increasing our general fund balance but i i, I, I want just to be fair for Fr to fred i want to say myself one million that that's the b bottom of of the of the i don't even know what they title it the uh, suggested Local yeah should there be one million dollars available i would like to propose that we start our program with one million dollars available and then get some more information from staff about the this road program thank you any other questions well from what i'm hearing from the Wait, i'm I, sorry all the yeses. Oh, sorry no question i say 1.5 million 
Because you get 1.2 and you got 1.8, so halfway in between is 1.5. I think the more the better, and let's figure out how to get there. Thank you. Okay. Well, from what I'm hearing from both sides of the table is you have questions A, B, and C here, but I think we need to uh, maybe tonight move that down the down the uh, down the street here and. Uh, I've heard that you'd like to have the pencil sharpened to be okay. If we're going to do one million, we're going to do 1.5. How do we get there? That's what I've heard from Alderman Dasis. You, Alderman Cannon, is uh, brought up an interesting point. So I think for tonight, it's not really uh, beneficial to even. We've heard, you've heard what the council has said. I think staff needs to come back and sharpen their pencil. And the specific questions that uh, Alderman Banger, Alderman Diastis, Alderman Cannon have brought up about how how do we get there? I mean, a specific. I know you've given us other uh, suggestions down there, but staff put a plan together and say, okay, if we're going to do 1.5, this is a specific plan. And this is what we're going to have to do with that. Do I any? Questions? It is uh, then. I think we should, for tonight, move those three questions down the road, and then have you come back with uh, specific answers to what the alderman have brought forward. Mr. Comstock, I understand what you're saying. It's just again, you've already heard the answer, so you're going to see something, and then the reaction is not going to be beneficial but we will get you something. Okay. Thank you. Yes, all of the jackets. I just, <coughs> excuse me, I just want to put it on record that I am in support of Alderman Banger and his suggestion. Okay. The one million. Thank you. Yes. I do want to just add one thing to the discussion because we didn't really go through the packet as far as the local road and how the revenue is built up in expenditures. We don't have to take the time now, but for the CIP, we will bring this back, um, just so you have all that those pieces. Um, but I did want to mention, too, if, remember it's two funds, MFT fund mm -hmm. and local road fund. So even if you bring it down to the one point, you know, like one million, you're still negative 800,000 in mm -hmm. local road. Mm -hmm. So we'll bring back all those pieces so you've got some, you know, working scenarios and those pieces. So we still have one more meeting with the Ad Hoc Capital Improvements Committee this week and we'll keep building this and bring it back in August. Okay, thank you. Number five. <laughs> um, as Alderman Banger has alluded to, this is the next discussion that we are actually having. Um, obviously, many folks on the uh, City Council know that um, obviously following the auditors, we have a few funds that do have fund balance. Part of it is the uncertainty of items obviously the health of different revenues as they continue on at that point in time when we started a fund balance policy and we talk about percentages and we also show you in months but we talk about percentages so when we started this we started with a 15 to 30 percent um, fund balance and obviously that's approximately two to three months of reserves now that we have many of those one-offs and obviously some revenues that have increased we continue to be healthy up to a point, but at the same point in time, it's time for us to have a discussion, again, what many other municipalities actually have higher fund balances in the general fund. What we're recommending is moving that low end of the 15 to 20 percent and the high end from 30 percent to 40 percent, and that gives an approximately two to five months, and it's typically at five to six months that most municipalities are keeping for the uncertainties and some of the other pieces. We do look at um, overall health. We do look at some of the other pieces that we have held. Um, unfortunately, obviously, when we are budging even for the 16 budget, 17 budget, 18 budget, when you see we are still holding some money in reserve because of ongoing union negotiations. So I would love to say in a great world that we would be done with those union negotiations and then hopefully that money would actually reallocate at a different time, but you can never guarantee. 
but at this point in time, it's really staff's recommendation to actually increase, again, it's only five percentage points from the low end, it's 10 percentage points on the high end. Again, increasing the number of months that we have in reserves. Um, there is rational why we did the starting of a fund balance policy, and again, it's just trying to make sure of where we sit at this point in time. So that's my quick analysis and summary. Um, I do turn it over to Finance Director Melissa Gallagher if she wants to add more to this. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Mr. Kremstock. I think you've summarized all the highlights here, and we're happy to take any questions. Uh, we did want to just, again, mention that is a discussion we did have with the city's auditors after the audit was finalized. Given the um, items that we're kind of faced, we're looking at potentially looking at those things as far as the 5% either way. So bringing that to a, a more of a, you know, two to five months makes a lot more sense um, given the track record that we've had so far. But I think more to the point is that we're trying to manage this effectively going forward and we're comfortable with this and we wanted to bring this back for city council for review and discussion. Thank you, Melissa. Questions from the council? Alderman Diestas. Thank you. Um, without saying that's what the neighboring communities are, communities are doing, explain to me the benefit and the rationale of why we should move this, our, 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 our fund balance uh, policy from 15 to 20 percent. What is, what's the benefit to the residents by doing that? The benefit, the biggest benefit is any increase in fund balance policy actually allows for, um, I don't want to call it a hedge, but for the reserves to make sure that for any uncertainties um, that the state could go after LGDF so they could lose a million dollars out of there. Let's say hypothetically there are eight different uh, bills down in Springfield that deal with red light. Two of them would not harm the city, but the other six would. So that would be a million dollars in reserve. Um, all those hedges that we now have, it allows the city and the council to feel comfortable that operations maintain at the level that they were budgeted for, plus they maintain what people have become accustomed to. Um, taxes lag. And we know that the state of Illinois many times has been three, four months behind. And reserves are the ones that allow you to make sure that you're making your payroll. And as you know, when the city was having financial issues, we did take short-term loans to make sure that we were paying all of our bills and overall. So, again. So, thank you. Um, but seeing as how our range is 15 to 30%, could we not just take it upon ourselves and do everything you're saying and say, bring it up to 20? We know we only have to have 15, but we're going to strive to get 20 without making it policy. We can. And so then right what now is the benefit? Since we already have it within that range and we can already do that, why do we need to increase the range uh, on the low end or the high end, since we can already be at 30%, which is effectively four months. And we've already got that range there. Why do we have to handcuff ourselves and do it higher? The control of the accountants tell us to do that? No, it's okay. also making sure that there's a comfort level. Um, again, we look at percentages, other people. But um, the bond the bond council looks at months, but we um, just felt that it was comfortable to make that low end just move up and but again. But we can do that because the low end. And is you can change already. policy, the fund balance policy, anytime. So I know, but it's we've already got twenty percent in there. We could mm -hmm. say we know the low is fifteen, and 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 just in case we have to hedge our bets, the fifteen is the worst we want to ever have. We're going to personally strive for, to make it 20 across the board and go to 30. And if we get to 30, then we can talk about changing it to go to some higher number. But at this point in time, when I'm trying to find another half a million dollars to fund roads, to fix roads, to fix our infrastructure, I don't see the sense of putting money there 
just because in case something happens and maybe the state won't give us some money. I don't think we have to force ourselves to do that. We can voluntarily do that within the range that we've already established. So I'm a no on this one all the way. Other uh, questions? My uh, comment would be to that is that um, I wasn't on the council in 2008, but I was part of some commissions and saw what uh, happened when we had gone through reserves and we did not have enough of a cushion. And there was a scramble where we had to do a lot of things that were hard on the city and the citizens. I hear what you're saying in regard to uh, we have all these other projects out there, but we also have to realize that we've got to be good stewards of this because we it's state of Illinois is not going away with their problems just because they solved a budget this year doesn't mean they will have a budget next year so and again if it helps our financial rating going down the road that's what we look that's what we look at and the policy was put together that we can change it every year so if we go to 20 and 40 and the state gets their house in order and we want to go back to 15, we can do that, so. Mr. Albert Banjer. Thank you. Um, I'm, a, I'm an I don't care on this. Um, <laughs> the the 20 to 40, the only thing that frightens me about that is the floor, not the ceiling. We're at 34% in our fund balance now, so I don't think there's any threat whatsoever near term uh, of us piercing the floor so the reason I don't care is we're we're changing a policy and this is simply a policy and we talked about this when we established this policy um, I'm all for what our city manager and our finance directors say to do so so again we can change the policy and I'll and I'll vote for that if, if it comes to a straw poll tonight um, the reason I kind of called this out earlier is I just find it kind of amusing to be talking about this when, as Mr. Dast just mentioned, we've got a bunch of big nuggets that that we that we'll be spending. I don't think, however, uh, uh, changing a fund balance policy is going to af affect those decisions. And if it does, I think it will affect them in a, in a positive way. In other words, we have that new floor, which which will bar us until we want to change that policy back from spending down past that 20 percent so I, I i like that aspect of it again it's kind of a conversation i don't see the purpose of because we're we're well within we're well within our parameters um but yeah i if they're suggesting to change it i'm i'm going to go ahead and, and go along with that i i have the utmost trust in our uh, management here thank you okay uh alderman my, my, as a general nature, you know, I I, I would also say and in, in say that uh, our finance director and our city manager have a handle on what they think is best. But look, as I've alluded to many t times already tonight, this year is probably one we haven't seen in quite a while as far as certainty of funds moving to us or from us. And so my question to you, Barry, is let's say we establish a fund policy of 20 to 40. Now, that's a managerial range, but how, how does it affect us in the outside financial world if in even one month we were to drop below the minimum? They would not see the minimum for one month. Okay, so because when they would when look would at, they start seeing a spin below the minimum? They would see it when our CAFR came out. So probably a quarterly type basis or a balance okay. at a quarterly measurement mark. All right, or like what we do here in Rolling Meadows is we give you quarterly reports. Right. So once we publish and we would show you that we were below that number, that would be the first red flag to them. All right. Okay, so... In a, in a time period when we are likely to go out to the bond market, and not in a small way, and the uncertainty that's going on in Illinois, 
why would I want to risk at a March 31st, June 30th, September 30th, December 31st measurement date to be below the minimum? That can only hurt me. So raising the floor to 20, while my conservative nature would say it's a great idea, this year doesn't make sense to me. It makes more sense to stay at the 15, knowing full well as a group, we don't want it to get down that low, but knowing that if it does, we've created some problems for ourselves. And so I, I gotta say on this one, I agree with Alderman Diastis that leaving the floor at 15 is not the worst thing to do right now, as long as we have the discipline amongst ourselves to know that that's a drop dead number. In no uncertain terms will we go underneath that, you know, because we threaten, you know, our financial status with the outside markets. So that would be my opinion on that. Thank you, Alderman Hill. Any other comments? So the direction you're looking for tonight is? If the council wants to change the fund balance policy in the general fund. And you can either do staff recommendations, or I think that we've heard 15 to 30 stays. We've also heard 15 to 40. Um, so. Well, well, we'll go with your first your choice here, just do a straw vote. How many would like to see the fund balance move from a floor of 15% to a floor of 20% to make the range from 15 to 30 to 20 to 40? Show of hands that would like that go forward with that. Those against? Okay, it stays at 15 to 30. Do you need anything else from us? I think, again, just some of the other discussions that come up that, again, um, one more vote if it was 15 to 40. And I think that goes back to what was alluded. Uh, we, there's no penalty to us for being above the max, is it? No, but that's when typically... I mean, other than the residents may get a little and anxious about that. And typically the bond is trying to figure out what you're doing with your fund balance policy. And if you have a fund balance policy and you're not living within it, they question that too. Uh, it, uh, hope, hopefully I'm in order here, but yes. the um, uh, personally with what's going on this year, and as you say, we generally review it. Yep. Uh, I, I see no reason to extend the max. Okay. So, so are we uh, done, Mr. You're done. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's been a great evening.